Ever feel like creepy guy is watching you? Have you ever been fished online and lost control of your social media accounts? What a hassle those can be. It's time to beware and be aware. Come on in with my guest, Mike Dandridge. I call him my personal secret service guy, and you will too. It's a beautiful day in paradise. And again, everybody, this is Debbie Montgomery Johnson coming to you from sunny South Florida. And today it is sunny and it's a beautiful day. And I have a very special guest here coming from up north. Boston. Boston. I knew I knew you were from Boston, everybody. I have Mike Dandridge visiting with me today. Hang on a second. I got someone else coming in. And it's probably cold in Boston. Actually, we have a sunny day today. We're, we're going to hit. We're going to get close to 70. So we're all celebrating. Oh my gosh. It's, it's summer in Boston. <laughs> exactly. Well, welcome, Mike. Thank you so much for being my very special guest today. I am so glad you're here because as we were just talking a minute ago, I've been going through some incredible triggers as far as personal security recently. Uh, and we're going to jump into that in a minute because I want to let people know who you are. And the reason I do this is because, first off, I like to do research on my guests. And I've tried to research you, and not much comes up. And I always laugh when that happens, because when I talk to my organization, which is SCARS, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, if you do a check on somebody, a Google check or whatever, not much shows up or nothing shows up, typically that person is a scammer criminal, or they work for DIA, CIA, alphabet soup, right? They're in the security Absolutely. business and they're not on there. So given your background, Mr. Dandridge, I've decided <laughs> that you belong to the ABC group <laughs> and you're in the security business and you are keeping a low profile. So Mr. Mike, tell everybody who you are. Uh, my name is Mike Dandridge. I'm from Boston, born and raised. And, uh, I've been in the security field for well over 20, 25 plus years. Um, I started off simple means as a doorman in a, in a nightclub and worked my way up through the ranks and then got into corporate America. And from there, I learned the basics of general security, but then uh, had the opportunity to keep growing and growing and learning more about the industry from uh, Global Operations Center to, which is like a 911 call center for a corporation. And then getting involved for different areas of threat assessment, travel security, but then had the opportunity to come out of the Global Operations Center and start up an executive protection group where myself and another individual were able to uh, branch out and we had to create a team, but also build a relationship with the company executives and ownership. And from there, it was just a constant grind just to get the proper training, get the crazy elite training. But then uh, you had to kind of scale it back down and to dealing with just the everyday person. And you're dealing in society and social media, the camera phone. So you're always going to be some type of target or, and you don't want to harm your client's image. So we, built it up. And then I was a, was fortunate enough to uh, build a relationship up with the ownership. And then just, we built a great relationship, was able to travel all around the world, uh, was able to experience different travel security incidences and learning threat management, threat assessment. And so uh, once I hit that, that tier where it's like, okay, it's time to take the next step, I decided to create my own business. Uh, and that's CD Risk Consulting. And it's just basically uh, given the opportunity to showcase my experience and help educate folks who just won't have that opportunity to have that access to someone that has my, my skills. And I created a course uh, for women traveling because I noticed that there was a lot of actually getting more aggravated watching the news and seeing all these incidences of young women getting themselves in trouble, but women overall, and unfortunately you have to society is the way it is and you really it's a lot of work to change that but you have to take that steps upon yourself to kind of step your game up and protect yourself and take yourself to another level just so that you can feel comfortable and that's what i wanted to offer 
Well, I know a lot of women, a lot of women executives that used to do a lot of traveling and have scaled back because of the pandemic, but are starting now to get out there. So I've got some contacts for you. <laughs> okay. Going back in time, though, when you were younger, did you have anything that happened to you that made you ultra aware of what was going on? Or were you kind of a happy-go-lucky kind of kid and just, I'm, your dad's on the phone here. I should ask you that <laughs> question. <laughs> Well, it, it started off just growing up in the inner city. You just have that street smarts. Um, you kind of, you you run with certain groups and, and, and people and you kind of figure things out on your own. And then there's times you get yourself into trouble on a couple of things. But uh, a lot of it was you, you're kind of watching what's going on around you in the city. But then I had an uh, incident when I was younger. Some kid wanted to try to he started asking me about my bike. I was riding it up and down my street and he attempted to try to take it from me. But fortunate enough, I had a friend and his brother was close by. So we uh, started yelling. His brother came down to help us out and the kid ran off. So that's where it's that guard started to come up. And then it's like, all right, be more aware of your surroundings, be more aware of people approaching you. What are the, what are, what is their, their game plan? So you just kind of have to, that was, that's where that edge started. Do you have siblings? Do you have any sisters? I have an older sister. Yes. And well, you're, so you're the younger brother. Although in time I have three brothers, one older and two younger. And at times it was my youngest brother that was the one that wanted to protect me. Absolutely. Because he's the youngest and he was around probably the longest. Uh, so I was just curious if there was that relationship because your your training is geared towards women. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know men, well, who probably think that they're safe too and maybe not. Um, <laughs> but we'll get into that because I really like what you're doing um, with situational awareness right now. And I think you and I had that conversation the first time I really heard those two words put together was years ago. My, my late husband, Lou, was a Air Force. We were both Air Force intelligence officers. He was actually a human trained. So human intelligence trained at mm -hmm. the, the farm the and farm, yeah. did, did the farm down at Langley did the defensive driving and always came back and talked about. Drive. He drove like a maniac in my mind as a passenger. He was a maniac. But he was always in control because he knew where he was at all times. And he would always say, watch, you know, watch the right front tire. Don't be on the mark and all these things. And when you start saying that thing, oh, my gosh, I'm back in uh, human training with Lou. But it's true because in that situation where we, after he passed away, a lot of his friends came and told my kids that, hey, your dad was a spy. But in that world, he was ultra aware of who was around him, what was around him. Uh, when we lived in Europe, I remember the security training saying, don't, and this is back before the wall went down in East Germany. So uh, we had the Russians over there and it's interesting that they've come back, but mm -hmm. they always said, change the way you're driving to and from work. Again, we were Air Force intelligence officers stationed in Germany. They were watching us, me, you know, creature of habit, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Lou, he did his thing. And one night, rainy night, I remember I was on my way down to church and I got in an accident. Somebody slid in and hit my car. I was waiting there because I didn't have cell phones back then. And I see the street and a car comes by and zooms on by. It was my husband. <laughs> he drove right past me. He's like, I'm not stopping. And I was like, right. what's going on here? But he was altered. He was aware of what was going on, but he was not going to get involved at that point, even though he thought he didn't know it was me. But my point was, he made his way around different routes home. I didn't. I was such a creature of habit, and I still am. For me, that's my safety route. You know, I do the same things. I eat, this, eat at the same restaurants and eat the same food. Um, why do we do that? Why are, why are, why are we wired? Yeah. And what, what does that make us susceptible to? We're a creature of comfort and don't like change. So we like to get into and we like to keep ourselves on a type of schedule. So we eat this way. I like to have this. And it's just when you come out of that realm of doing it differently, then it doesn't feel comfortable. 
doesn't feel right. So you're like, this is the way I do it. This is how I do it. And you just get into that rhythm. And uh, that's what happens on our daily lives. Okay, we get up at this time. I make my coffee. Then I go down, I'll walk the dog and I'll do this. And then I'll drive to th this certain gas station because it's just easy, comfortable, comfortable and easy. But that once I can sit and do surveillance, counter surveillance, and watch your routine, and then I get to know what you're doing. I know I would be able to figure out some people's habits before they even knew it. So uh, that was part of some of the stuff that we had to deal with our clients is we would sit and watch. I would get in a different car and I would just watch your habits. And then, okay, this is where a choke point can be where you could be potentially attacked or uh, you, you like going to this certain bar to have a certain cocktail, but then you're posting hey, I'm out having a, a nice cocktail with my spouse. But if anybody knows you, if you're leaving your kids at home, guess what? And especially if you're a high profile, then you're just opening up the world to getting anything they want from you. So it's just creature of habit. And, um, and it, it's just, you like to just get into a, a rhythm of things. And you know, and you know how you feel when uh, you're in your rhythm and something stops you. Then you're just flustered. You don't know what what to do, and uh, then you get aggravated. So that's what happens. You, you don't like to leave that comfort zone. We we kind of create uh, intentionally and unintentionally in our lives. So it, it's, and I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I, I take multiple routes uh, to and from my house. I. Uh, identify all the cars that are my parking lot. I know when there's a new car that's there. Um, and I take drives around different side streets. And if you see a car that's always there, I start to loop around and zigzag around different streets just to see if that car is following. Anybody, anybody think you're a little paranoid? Uh, some think I'm crazy, but then others know that uh, what I do. And sometimes I just like, you know what you're doing, I'm not gonna even ask. And, and again, that boils down to the training. And uh, uh, and my father could attest to it he, when I come back from our trainings. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we did J turns and we're doing reverse and like high speeds. And then I rammed somebody. And he's like, I don't want to know this. I don't want to know this. So, and even my both my parents and my sister just laughs. She's just like, man, that's, but they, I, I made that part of who I am, my identity. So people accept that and they get that. So they, they know I'm always watching. I'm always on. And some of the guys that formerly used to work for me would always ask, does it ever go off? I'm like, no, it's, it's part of your blood now. Well, but what you do though, and especially in telling your parents and whatever, when I'm sitting, I was sitting at a stop sign yesterday, uh, I've remarried and my husband and I were talking about the show and I was telling him as we were sitting at a stop sign, I'm like, you're too close to that car. You're on the X. You can't get out. He goes, what are you talking about? I was like, you were stuck. If somebody comes up behind you, you, there's no way for you to get out. And he goes, that's true. I said, so even I practice it. I might not talk about it, but I practice it. And you would essentially are keeping your neighbors safe because I heard you say that you know the sound of an ambulance. You know the sounds when doors are, are closing. So if I was one of your neighbors, I would feel very safe because you got my back. Right. You got my back. Right. And and many times we don't. And and this is going into this show. You and I was start telling you that I've had a very like Jen Lee who connected us. Jen has her creepy guy. Well, this week I had I got it's not hacked. And Dr. Tim McGinnis is has schooled me. It's not hacked. I was fished. And if any of you are out there and, you know, fishing on the internet, it is not a F I S H I N G, but it's this large net. And I got caught. I was distracted on Facebook messenger. I was doing something, get, getting making some airline tickets, getting excited about the holidays. And a friend, a friend, I thought Facebook messenger came up, say, Hey, you got a minute. I, I could use your help. So I wrote back. Sure. And it went from there. She had been put off of Facebook. She needed a third party you know, authentication. Basically, it was find a friend, phone a friend. I said, sure, send me the code. Sends me a code. I give them the code. Next thing I know, boom, my Facebook got 
fished, shut down. They changed the passwords. They changed all the security. And for the last three days, my triggers from being scammed years ago pop back up because now I feel like I've been violated. My you know, I, my uh, social media was compromised and I do a lot of my, so, my support group on social media. And I just felt like, oh my gosh, they've done it again. And part of me wants to shut down. I'm being very honest. I wanted to get off of Facebook. I wanted to get off of social media. I wanted to stop the show. I just wanted to, but that's what they want. They want us to be quiet. So Mike, in the training, especially for women and, and talk about Jen's creepy guy and what you told her to do and what she did right in reporting. This okay, is Jen so Lee, everybody. And Jen, I interviewed Jen. It's the I Need Blue podcast. You and Jen are, are uh, collaborating in a lot of ways. So folks, if you want to hear more about Jen's story, here's a pitch for Jen. But go ahead. Tell me about Creepy Guy and what you told Jen and how we should not hide. So uh, I'll chunk it down. So Jen was at a uh, podcast conference and uh, individual had approached her and she immediately had this gut feeling that something wasn't right about him and the way he approached her. And so one of the things I told her was she that she did right was she had another gentleman that was there that they were talking and she looked to him to say, is there something wrong with this guy? And he said, yeah, something's not right with him. So now there's some justification to that internal instinct, that, uh, that gut instinct to say something's off. So that's when your alert level goes up to another level. And so she made it a conscious effort just knowing where he was, what he was doing. And, but she did notice that he was paying special attention to it. And then the one incident that kind of frazzled her, she was decided to leave and got into the elevator to head to the parking lot in the parking garage and, and elevated to the parking lot was separate from the hotel. And as the doors were closing, he lunged for the doors and pried it open. And so she was like, all right, this is weird. And so now her, her alert level was up even further. And so uh, they exchanged conversation, very minor, but um, she was asked him if he was leaving. He's like, no, I'm going to my car because I'm parched. Uh, and in her mind, her wheels are spinning, which is perfect. So she is already identifying he's not right because we've passed all the free water in the hotel and you're going to a hot parking garage to get some water because you're parched. So the elevator door opens up, they get out, he gets out and he's waiting for her to step out. Luckily enough, she had her phone in her hand and quickly decided, hey, my out. Uh, I left something up back in the uh, conference. I need to leave. And then she was able to close the door, understanding his frustration. She got a hold of her friend to say, hey, something's not right. Come find me. I need your help. So the key thing was she listened to her gut. She knew something wasn't, wasn't right. And she had an out and that's what the wheels need to be spinning on is what is your next move to get out either flee or as we, we discussed on the other podcast, it's okay. Do I fight? But at this point it, it didn't get to that point, but you need to start thinking of the what ifs. And that's what I like to talk, like get in everybody's head, get in that mind of what if, what if, what if, and that's getting your brain to, create uh, scenarios and get to how to get out of those scenarios. And by getting your mind into that kind of focus, your body would follow if that situation would arise because now you've mentally formatted a plan. So she was able to get out, get back to the conference, uh, meet up with the friend, and then uh, the friend was now helping her out and then noticed that this creepy guy was back in the lobby looking around. And he seemed to be looking around on his phone to kind of pinpoint where she was, where there's that potential of being tracked on uh, by your phone, by your Wi-Fi, like if you're on a public Wi-Fi, Let's, being able to be tracked that way. Talk about that, because when I heard you guys talking about that and the airdrop thing, 
part of me is like, well, that'd be great. I need that from my mother. But the creepy thing is, what is it? What is it doing? I had not heard about those things. So please explain the airdrop and how people on public Wi-Fi can track you. So on a public Wi-Fi, it's just everyone's going. It's like I'm trying to think of how to, simplest way to put it. Everyone's signal is bouncing off an open airway, and if an individual has the right technology, either on their phone or device, they can pinpoint your IP address which is associated with your phone. And so you're able to ping where that person is depending on which Wi-Fi signal. That's why you see a lot of the advertisements now on TV with identity fraud saying, get a VPN, a virtual private network. And I utilize that a lot, especially when I was traveling throughout China. It's just, you don't want, anyone to infiltrate your signal to figure out where you are or see the Im information that's being sent out over an open net, which is the Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi. So anybody with the intelligence and the tools can get that information and start pinging you and following you. And then to the uh, air tags, the Apple air tag, uh, which is a great tool. I'll, Put, put it up just for so that you better understand it. The It's a great tool, great little device, and it, it's intent. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's a little, little bit larger than a quarter. Its intent was to be able to put it on your bag if you're in tracking luggage to the airport, put it on your handbag and um, in case you put it down somewhere or your wallet, in case someone steals it, you can track it. And it has been positives. Uh, a couple of items that were stolen in, in the media that made it to the media, they were able to, police were able to track it because of the air at the Apple AirTag. The negative side of it is it can be placed on an individual in your bag without you knowing it. Mm. And I can track you. And so it's as as technology comes out if it's good used for the right it's a it's perfect yeah if it's used for the negative so you, you, it's one of those you gotta kind of understand it more to know how it's tracking you but with apple they realized that their the device was being used for tracking so what they also enabled enabled it was if you are an apple phone user and I were to be standing next to you with an AirTag, it will tell you that your another device is tracking you. And I think they're working on, if they haven't done it yet, for Android, so that anybody with a non-Apple phone can use this app to show if there's a device tracking your movement. And it'll alert your phone and let you know. You, you had mentioned that story about a fella that thought he was being tracked and it turned out that the man beside him, his keys had an air tag on it. Yes. Yes. So um, a gentleman that we did a speaking engagement in, in uh, Melbourne, he was uh, he deals with the amusement parks and uh, he was escorting a family around. And all of a sudden his phone started going off saying that you're you're being tracked. Somebody's tracking you. And so he kept looking down his phone. Why am I getting these alerts? And he's looking around. Someone's had an air tag on their bag and they were too close to each other and it was picking up. It's because they were escorting each other around. That's why it was saying he was being tracked. Is there a setting on your phone that you can turn on or off? Or are we? Uh, as far as to be tracked on with the air tag? Yeah. Well, not necessarily. I mean, you need, you want to make sure you have the um, find my phone app. Right. That's going to tr let you know that you're being followed. Okay. It's going to, that will pick up on surrounding Apple devices. And that's where it, it, it initially started out as find my friends. So anybody that had a friend who was on an Apple product, you could be at the library and you said, oh, Debbie's at the library, and then I can ping you to say, hey, I'm at the library as well. Uh, so now they've if you lose your AirPods or if you lost your phone or lost your, your um, iPad, 
that was one way it was constantly sending a signal so that you can go onto that app and pinpoint where it is. So well, that find a friend was important in my world because my daughter was uh, single and she was out dating. One of my girlfriends uh, was out dating and they said, we're going to let you know we're at this restaurant. So every now and then just check and make sure that we're there. Not that I could do anything with my daughter in Dallas, but, I could <laughs> <laughs> but so there is good and there's bad. And that's the problem. Technology, there's a lot of good for the scammers. I always said if they can do for good what they do for bad, they would be phenomenal. Exactly. Phenomenal. Exactly. Yes. And we don't think bad. I no. don't think annoying. I don't think that I'm going to, you know, fish someone's account. That's not me. They they ruin our lives by by that, you know. And so Absolutely. and this this is virtually you do a lot of work in person. They can ruin your life in person. There was right. a I watched a show the other day. I think it was um, Nightline, Dateline, where a gal in Louisiana had been kidnapped from her own home. I don't know if you yes. saw that story. No, um, I, I haven't seen that one, but I'm. She, it, it she well, turned out to be the ex-husband, but she was. She, she. The only reason they found her is because a, a, a cop who was on his way home was at a stop sign or stoplight and could notice the guy in front of him in a white van was really edgy. Again, situational awareness. He was Absolutely. looking in his rearview mirror. He was acting really funky. And then he gets off on the side and drives up the uh, the edge of the road. And the cop goes, well, that's odd. Followed him. Mm-hmm. Two guys followed him, turned his lights on, pinned him up. And then they stopped the car. They jump out of the car. And he opens up the back of this van. And some, he saw, thought he saw a mannequin. And it moved. Scared the crap out of him. He closes the door. He's like, well, wait a minute. It opens up again. And this is, it's this woman that had been kidnapped from her own home. So fortunately, again, the police officer had situational awareness that Mm -hmm. there's something wrong with what is going on here. Uh, But otherwise she would have just been taken from her home in a small town in Louisiana. So we think we are safe, but we, and we don't want anybody paranoid. I don't want you just thinking, oh my gosh, the world's after me. The whole plan here, Mike, is that we have a plan. We are aware of what's going on. We have a plan in the back of our mind that will kick in when our instincts are peaked. And that's where I think I am not as good as I could be in listening to my gut. I, 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 I and you mentioned this with Jen and Jen's story about we want to be nice. We want to give the benefit of the doubt. We don't want to call anybody. What is wrong with that? Yes, that's that's huge because it's your your instincts, your gut feeling. That's something that an internal mechanism is to keep you safe. And we're taught to be polite and uh, to be nice, and uh, so. We want to kind of push down that instinct to be like, all right, I don't want to seem bitchy or angry or mean or what have you and have that negative connotation. Uh, Let me see what this person's all about, or maybe it's just me, but you're, you're putting down your own defense mechanisms. You're ignoring. And then that's, then once you finally realize you that, wait a minute, I should have listened to my gut. You're already too far into it. So you have to be, you are number one, your responsibility to, for your protection, your safety. So that's trust your gut. I mean, trust that instinct. So I'd rather be more standoffish. And then if I'm wrong, I'll apologize. It's like, and then, but also maybe, that person's giving off a vibe that they don't know, but also if they're if they they have ill intent, I'm letting you know, I know what you're all about. Something's not right about you, and it's now my guards up, and I'm going to pay attention to you even more, and let you know I'm, I'm watching you. And it's tough because even when you were a child, that situation. I have a lot of uh, friends who now they're in their fifties and sixties. Uh, they go back to when they were kids and were bullied and never did anything about it. And it still haunts them to this day. You actually encourage people to physically posture up. 
Right. I mean, back in the day, our dads would say, well, go, you know, go clobber them and show them who's boss. <laughs> Can't do that anymore because now the kid that hits back is going to get in trouble. But what can we do physically? Give us some tips on, on what makes us a little more daunting back. It's you're you're creating a persona uh, of a hardened person. So you get your shoulders up and chin up. What happens if I'm looking down and my shoulders are slumped? I'm, I'm appearing more weak. I'm going to stand up stronger, chest up, chin up, and I'm going to make eye contact. And it's going to say, hey, I'm looking at you. I see you. And then now I'm going to maintain that open structure, but also I'm going to start to look around to find out where's my out. I'm going to keep that space between us. And now the wheels are spinning. So it's you want to look at where's your out, where's the safest place to go, who can you go to and speak to to say, hey, listen, this gentleman or this woman, they're, they're creeping me out. For whatever reason, I'm not sure, but I don't want to find out at this moment. I just need you to help me get out or run interference, uh, ask, to go talk to them. So when you're, if they're talking to them, now they're distracted, you can make your out. So it's start to look around. It's like, okay, now I got to get a, plan together. Whether you're out in the street, you see someone, you're like, all right, I'll make eye contact. And then you keep doing your thing. And then all of a sudden you notice that person's still there, make eye contact again. And then it's like, okay, something's not right. Do I get my phone out and get a call somebody? Do I, if I'm in a store, do I go to the store manager to say, this guy's creeping me out or this woman's creeping me out or something's not right? Um, if they approach, can, be, don't be afraid to speak up. Can I help you? Who are you? Do I, I know you? And is you're making a scene, so now you're drawing attention to you. So, and if someone's going to do something, they don't want attention drawn to them. Mm. So you want to speak up, say something. Can I help you? Are you okay? Do I know you? And so people are starting to, and you stay at that level. So you draw attention if someone's listening, going, maybe that person needs help. What's going on? Someone will walk over. What's happened? I don't know, but this guy's been following me around for the last 10 minutes. And if they say, oh, no, no, no then they leave. But then you now you're you have additional eyes that have seen this person doing a mental description. So if you do have to take it to the next level of calling the police, you have a description. You have your phone. Everybody has their phones. Take a quick picture. I don't scare them. <laughs> and, or it's like you're doing like you're doing a selfie. You're taking a quick picture of them. So now you have a clear view and you don't have to worry about learning the, the details because you're, you're, your mind's gone mm -hmm. and it's, you're, at a, you're at a high intensive level and not that many people can control themselves and think properly or train to work at that level. So find the simplest thing. Take a quick picture. And then if the, when the police come, you're like, here's, here's a description of this person. That's a great idea. And think about that now, because we all have our phones on us. It drives us crazy when the kids don't answer because you know that phone's glued to their hip. Yeah, uh, exactly. But just get it in your mind. Take a picture. Because how many times do, I mean, our kids, four-year-olds will get out there and they'll posture for these selfies. I'm like, where did you learn that? It comes from having their picture taken all the time. But right. kick in. And it's interesting. It takes me back to when I had this, the scam was revealed and the, he, the criminal came online, of course, you know, after two years and you know, my story, but uh, yeah. he came online and I saw him. And in that instant, my guard went, you know, now I'm, now I'm all alert as to what's going on. I was like, Oh my gosh, what had happened? First thing I did pulled out my phone and I took a picture. I don't know where that came from. For two years, I had not, you know, gotten seen him in person. Now all of a sudden I get, I, I know what's happening. And I pulled my phone out. Right. It's the only picture I have of the real guy. Mm -hmm. Couldn't do anything with it, but that gave me a face to a criminal. Right. Uh, and we don't do that. And I used to work in the bank. I was a bank manager and, and the bank was, was um, held up one day. I wasn't there, but we had markers on the doors trained everybody, look to see, you know, what's their height, try to mm -hmm. see what their, what their hair was like, and, you know, are they old, young, masked, blah, 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 a little harder when the pandemic and masks, 
Right. But again, that training, that security training, you hope you never have to use it. But if you have it, it's in you and something will kick in. Something will kick in. What's the training that you do for, for the women that are traveling or families in general, I think would be really good to know. I this. mean, anybody could. Anybody could take the course courses, and and it's basically to think beyond just all right. I have my hotel, I have my I book my flights, uh, and it's time to go. It's think of multiple things. Utilize the technology that we have. Make sure the hotel is in a, a nice place. And even now with the whole Airbnbs, make sure they're in a well cleaned safe area. You can do like Google Maps, you can do street view, and you can literally walk around the neighborhood just to see what it looks like. Um, Especially with some of these cities where the hotels are going up, no matter where they are, like in Boston, they just put up, well, there's several years now, but they put up a a posh boutique hotel next to the homeless shelter. Mm. And you're like, okay. And so, uh, you have to kind of designate where's going to be that safe spot. Then take it another first, another step further to adding different things to your, your, your packing list, a flashlight, uh, a doorstop. So a flashlight, everyone's like, oh, we got a flashlight on the phone, but you don't want to use, if you lose power or something happens, you don't want to use up the battery on your phone. Uh, the doorstop and, as just another added layer of security for some doors just don't lock properly on the main doors, or you may get a hotel room that has the uh, joining rooms and you don't know who's there. So that's another layer that you can add. Um, And then just, it has a different checklist that will provide you different things to think about. And then the other side, just look at some of uh, the stuff that I, I do a lot of my advanced work is to look at the closest hospital. Mm. Uh, clinics because I mean we're looking at the restaurants where we're going to do all this adventurous stuff but the most common things are people getting injured or sick now what do you do and if you're especially if in a different country you want to make sure you're you're utilizing a hotel I mean a hospital that has an international clinic so you'll get that western style of service but then additional layers just helping you built a plan. So if something were to happen, you already have a plan in place instead of, oh my God, what am I going to do now? You lose your documents, something gets stolen, Um, flights get canceled, another pandemic. And so you just start getting to have a plan in place so that reactionary time, that stress time reduces. And, uh, but also if parents, like one of the things I'm noticing now, parents sending their their daughters over uh, overseas to uh, study abroad. What it, you need to question what the colleges or the high schools have a plan in place for their students in case of emergency. Do they know how to utilize those products? Do they you know the services? So it's just getting folks to another layer of making sure you have an enjoyable, not making you p- paranoid, but you're well aware and that react reduce that re- reactionary time and the stress and drama that comes surrounds it. So you you kind of like we said, just instincts kick in. Let's get to work. Let's get through this, and then let's get home. And it's doing your homework. I remember a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, I was over. I traveled to India, and I was going to a conference, but in southern India. But I had to fly through Mumbai, big city, right? My IT guy lives in Mumbai. He, well, I got, I got a 30 hour flight. It was a long trip. I exhausted when I get there, I get through customs and customs at 1130 at night in a country never been to before. A lot of people, but I'm there talking to the customs person who's really giving me a hard time. And he goes, you've been here before. I was like, nope, never been here before. However, during the scam, the two year scam, I actually got a visa to go to India. I was going to meet my guy in India. Never went there, thank goodness, but it showed up. So now I'm dealing with this. I didn't want to tell the whole story. You wouldn't have believed it, but I finally got through. I had Raj meet me there because in India, personal space is like nothing. We talked about personal space before America. Woo, we got lots of room. India, oh my gosh, here it was, five foot eight, blonde, 
I stuck out like a sore thumb and people were like packed against me. And we don't want to be carrying a pocketbook or something, you know, out there. I was already flashing American, American. Thank goodness Raj was there. And he goes, I'm getting you a hotel room right here at the airport. Walked me there. Thank goodness. Cause it was, ugh, it was right nearby, but it was dark. Mm-hmm. Got me there. And then the very interesting thing was he was going to escort me to the room. Well, that's not done in India. They kept an eye on him. Like, who is this man walking you to that room? How long will he be there? Get out of here. Which I was grateful for. Next morning, he was there, picked me up, walked me back to the airport, up to security. Because security there at the beginning of the airport, they're standing there with guns. Right. He just wanted to get me through the door. And then Mm -hmm. he goes, you're on your own. Huge airport. You're on your own. But I was a little bit scared of this, you know, not having my personal space and not Mm -hmm. understanding the culture of India. Mm -hmm. And that's huge because if I'd been there by myself, no one would have known where what happened to me if something happened. So it's knowing where you're going, who's going to be there, maybe having a buddy like dating, have a dating buddy, (laughs) have somebody over there. You know, I love what you're doing just to make people. It's always beware and be aware have right. that plan and then you won't be scared. Right. Now, you also said, I love this, get off the X. What does that mean to the average person? They don't have the training you and I've had. Put that okay. in the scenario of traveling or driving or whatever. Being online, I don't pay attention, even though I'm the, one of the experts. I don't, I'm not right. paying attention to the X when I'm online. Okay, let's start with the simplest one. So the the driving. So uh, we all do it. Uh, and where you come to a red light or a stop sign and you have a car in front of you and you get close enough, almost right onto their bumper. And that's not allowing you to move around them in case you have someone that's a carjacker or someone's just trying to get into your car because you have, you're driving a fancy car. Um, and, and, and again, the pandemic has brought out a whole nother level of, I don't wanna say mental instability, but a lot of issues have come out of it where people, their boundaries are off. Mm-hmm. And so they want your car, they're gonna come after your car. Or if you're on your phone, you're not paying attention. And like some instances that are, will happen with, if I'm following a young, well, not me, but if I was the enemy, following a young lady and I want to rob her, I'm going to lightly tap your car just to get you to pull over. And it's another trick. So that's where you want to be like, this is not right. Let me just keep going. So I always leave space enough, half car length minimum, so that I'm able to turn the wheel into oncoming traffic, get up, drive up on the curve, to get out of there. And whether it's you, you get there, you look at the lights, you look in your mirrors, you're checking your right, your left, and you're just listening. And we all get in our own world. Sometimes we pick up the phone, see who's texting us, but it's just being able to get off that point. The X is the point of where you're going to be attacked. So whether you turn the wheels, get out, drive over the curb in the parking lot, <laughs> you're walking out to your car and you see the cars, the parking lot's empty, but you have two cars parked right next to you on either side, and you see people sitting in them. You're you're sitting on the X, so turn around and go back inside and, and try to get somebody to help you walk you to your car. Uh, call the police. You may be a little paranoid, but better safe than sorry. Uh, traveling, you're standing out. Uh, as, as we say, the American eyes with your flashy jewelry on and you're taking in the sights, but you're standing in one point where somebody could sit and watch you uh, and then kind of get a read on you, start following you. If you're not paying attention to your surroundings, they can easily pickpocket you, push you down, take your phone, um, and definitely steal your jewelry. So it's just, not staying in one point 
or uh, boxing yourself into a corner, big, giving yourself, as we call it, the out, the ability to leave that one spot, situation, room, uh, parking lot, whatever it may be, you have an avenue to get out, get away, whether it's back up, go back into the house, uh, go back into the building to get somebody, or, or create some space and put some layers in between you and the potential threat. And I think sometimes, at least for me, uh, the personal safety is a little bit easier to recognize, you know, that, that gut feeling. Uh, the online stuff, not so much for many people. We all feel so safe being online. And we should be ultra aware that there are criminals out there trying to get either our money or access to our information or whatever. Uh, you had a good story that we, when we talked about uh, the grandma scam. We have a lot of grandmas listening to the story. A lot of children need to hear the story. You had a neighbor. Can you tell us the story about your neighbor and that grandmother scam call that she got? So she, uh, woman, I think she's in her in her early seventies, alone. And uh, her dog, she did a lot of stuff work with rescue dogs. Last dog passed away. Now she was feeling that she wanted another dog. And so she started searching and searching and searching. And then she ended up finding um, a so-called breeder and um, was trying to work with them to get the dog. And so uh I don't know, there was a lapse in communication, but then she had, she knew that I knew some stuff and she's like, can you check this out for me? So I'm reading through the emails and I'm like, something's not right about this. And they were saying, well, uh, we could, uh, we need you to pay this way. And they wanted to have her pay what set it off. And she's like, I need to go get another uh, $500 uh, gift card. I'm like, you're paying a breeder in gift cards. And I'm like, that's not right. And then she's like, well, I go, what, where, what's their breeder license? Uh, where are they located? And so she started giving me all the information. And uh, so I'm like, give me the emails. I'm going to do my research. I tracked down where the house, so, so-called house was supposed to be. It was a rundown house in some random neighborhood. Nothing that appeared uh to have any type of setup for dogs. Um, and then she sent me another if, if piece of information. They said, well, you could pay us via um, Venmo. So I then researched the Venmo account. It was just some teenage girl in Mississippi and she was supposed to be picking the dogs up from North Carolina. Like I go and I told her, I'm like, I don't think, asked to see some pictures of the dog ask them for more information. And their response was, oh, uh, I can't send them to you now. My daughter's in the hospital. And, but if you send me the money, I'll, everything's good. I'll send you the dogs and we'll be good to go. And then I told her not to do it. Wait till you get pictures. Her emotions got the best of her and she proceeded. Fast forward. Now she's like, I got to get another thousand dollars because the dog is now at the shipping company, oh, but they don't, they don't have their shots. I have to pay for them to get their shots. I'm like, what shipping company does veterinary shots? I'm like, you need to stop what you're doing. Emotions got the best of her. She sent it forward. Fast forward, no dog. And she was out a couple thousand dollars. So they get you in with, they started pulling her in by her emotions and her emotions kept uh, just pushing full. And, and it's the same thing with relationships. You have someone's giving you the, the lovey dovey stuff and but your emotions. Well, it's, are... it's called the amygdala hijack. <laughs> yes. And that's it really, it hijacks your brain and, and you, you don't see those red flags. I called them pink flags for years. You don't mm -hmm. see those red flags that someone from the outside, your dating buddy or your neighbor or someone else might might see those. And we will never minimize what the victim has gone through. That's victim blame. And that's not it. These guys are skilled in what they right. do. Right. They know better how mm -hmm. to get us than, than we know how to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, it's they'll catch I mean, it could be a dog. It could be a, a relationship, a husband, a wife that you're looking for. It could be 
a purse, you know, right. or a pair of Jordan shoes or something that has your attention and you don't pause. Like I loved, you know, when we were younger, it was like your grandmother would say, sleep on it. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. We jump. My husband or my mother, she'll crack me up. She'll say, I think I need such and such. Well, guess what I do? I go and get on Amazon. Gets delivered the next day. Instant like, gratification. I'm not going to ever say I need anything because you get it for me. That's how we are these days. Instant. Right. Our attention right. span is that of a gnat. Mm -hmm. We want to jump on it. But yes. you're saying, take a pause. Absolutely. And then, and then after she got burnt, then she was quiet for a little bit. And then she's like, hey, I'm looking at another dog. I'm like, oh, Lord, here we go again. So I'm like, give me the information. And so she gave me a little bit, but then she kind of held off. She's like, I'm like, just take time to ease back. Here are the red flags to look for. And, uh, and I go, but if you're not going to listen to me, I'm not going to waste my breath. But I'm just at least going to give you the key things that you need to look for. Fast forward, she waited, and then, oh, it was another scam that started to happen again. And once she realized it was a scam, because she she's like, I think it's another scam. And I'm like, give me the name. Went through, I did a background on them. I'm like, that person doesn't exist. She's like, all right, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, good. Fast forward another month or so. She's like, I have a dog. Bless she, you. <laughs> she finally showed me the dog. I'm like, I am not saying a word, but good for you. Well, yeah, it, it's it was rough. And, and I think you've got to the point where many times we get to the point where we'll we'll tell them, we'll instruct them, we'll give them the information, and then it's their choice. It's your choice to keep going. Once you once you understand what the precautions are, once you understand what the strategies are. Uh, we're adults. And right. as I told my boys in the middle of the scam, I'm 52. I'm the adult here. Leave me alone. They right. did. Two years later, I had to eat humble pie, say, I'm really sorry, boys. But that's the thing, because then after you've been taken, you don't want anybody to know. Right. And if you don't tell, then the person beside you is going through the same thing, wishing they had right. a buddy. So uh -huh. you're the buddy. You're yes. the buddy. And you have the strategies and the tips yes. and the information, and we have to get it out there. So, Mike, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, my, my website is www.cdriskconsulting.com. Um, I'm constantly on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram handle is Mike underscore Dandridge, D A N. D R I D G E. And I'm actively on that. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. It's Mike Dandridge. Uh, and I'm constantly posting on Instagram. I have uh, my courses are on my website, um, but then uh, other services that I offer are on the website. So once again, cdriskconsulting.com. Is that an online class or do you do it in person or? This, these are online classes that will run all the time, but then I'll be constructing some workshops, live workshops, so that we could go over a topic. So say situational awareness or items to pack or doing the research and get a group setting. And then if you have any questions, I can answer them live there. So that's in the process now of creating those workshops so that anybody can join and we can work out different topics and then but the courses always will be there. And then I offer a high ticket where I'll work closely with an organization or individuals that want that extra layer for themselves. And uh, you give me a hard time because I did promote you as my, my own secret service agent. <laughs> you did not work for the secret service, but you have worked with many of the agencies uh, and big companies. You worked for, with Fidelity for a while and uh, have done a lot of executive training and have traveled around the world with executives and their families. You know what you're talking about. And I certainly appreciate the connection that Jen, Jennifer Lee, and I Need Blue podcast. Yes, uh, thanks, Jen, Jen. Jen brought you into my life. And I think everybody needs to have a mic in the pocket. I appreciate that. I'm happy to meet with you and speak with you. I'm glad we're able to kind of 
talk it out and share our, our thoughts out here. Well, and, and I was work, talking with Dr. Tim McGinnis, who's the founder of SCARS, uh, again, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams. And I was telling Tim about this show today, and he goes, see if Mike will do a webinar with us for our support yeah. group, because it's not just personal, uh, physical awareness of what's going on. It's online, because all of us are online every day, all day long. And unless you get shut down, shut out by a Facebook scammer. Uh, and I'm not supposed to say that it's the Facebook platform because it's not. I was not hacked by Facebook. I was fished by a criminal acting as a friend on Facebook Messenger. So beware, be aware, take a pause. If a friend or someone tries to contact you there, my, I can't shoulda, coulda, woulda, but I should have text my friend i had her phone number saying hey yes because as soon as it happened to me i started getting messages my sister-in-law called my nephew in germany had gotten the same thing from me and and a video and she's saying mom what's aunt deb doing so she's contacting me honestly i got bombarded by people and i finally wanted to say stop i'm working on it it ruined my morning it can happen in an instant this could Physically, it could happen in an instant. Jen's creepy guy, if she had not listened to her, you know, her gut and had let him in and then followed and got off, heaven forbid, you guys listen to Jennifer Lee's story on I love, I love, I need blue, I need blue.net, I need blue.net. It's a podcast where Jennifer Lee and Mike. Mike Dandridge, uh, they talk about it. They talk about the situation, situational awareness. They talk about the value of reporting to get an incident report. Cops can't do things for a lot of online stuff, a lot of personal, if there's no crime committed, but it goes into the system. What are they looking for if you put it in the system? Really quick, Mike. They're, they want, like when they call to have, um, to report an incident, so they'll get a general log of what the individual looks like, what the incident is. And it's something that they can refer back to. So if there is further incidences, they can build a trail. When nothing's mentioned, then it's, all right, we're, we're starting from the beginning. But if it started months ago and they can start saying, all right, it's filed. Here's a name. We could pass it on to whatever local authorities that are in your area. So there's a, a trail. And that's what any investigation, any incident is starts with a trail. And so that they could build up if there was something that you didn't say anything for months, but there was multiple things this individual's done for the police. They're like, well, we don't have a trail, so we're kind of limited on what we can do. If there's that trail, then they're like, well, we have this report, this report, this report, this report. Now we need to take it to another level. And well, a lot of people will say, well, I, don't, I thought it was just something small that I didn't want to interrupt the police. This is their job. Mm -hmm. This is what they're here for, to, to protect you. But if you don't say anything, they can't protect you. Yeah. Well, there's the value of report, report, report. And I know victims of crimes and victims of online fraud don't want to do that, but please do. It's important for the next person, not necessarily for you, but for the next person, the woman or man sitting beside you. Mr. Dandridge, thank you so very much. I really appreciate you today and all that information. Folks, go to cdriskconsulting.com. Uh, look into Mike's travel classes, especially if you're a, a young woman. All of us are young at some age. Uh, well, my traveling is for everybody. Uh, but I appreciate you paying particular attention to the women and the women in your life, uh, the women who could be in your life, because this makes a big difference and, and to our own feeling of safety. So ladies and gentlemen out there, thank you so much for being with us on Stand Up and Speak Up. It's been another wonderful guest, another wonderful day. Go out there and please be careful, be aware, and beware. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.